It's How to Kill a Piano, episode 20. I'm George Tate. Thanks for listening and for tuning back in, as always. So when we last left each other, I left you with two things. I left you with a teaser of a story for this week, and I also left you with a teaser of announcing the contest winner for our giveaway for the official How to Kill a Piano mug. I delayed it a week, and I did that for two reasons. One, I wanted to give people a reason... Uh, or rather a little more time to catch up. And I also wanted to give you a chance to enter as well. And I do have a winner to announce today, and I'll be doing that in just a few moments. But first, let me explain how the contest worked. And if you missed it, don't worry. There'll be more contests in the future. I'll be doing more giveaways. So make sure you're over on my Instagram, which is thinkgeorgetate. That's all one word. For this contest, you had to follow me there. So if you haven't, do that anyway. Then you had to like the post with the mug in question and tag some folks. That was it. For every person you tagged, you got an entry into possibly winning the How to Kill a Piano mug. I took all of those entries and all those names. I inserted them into a spreadsheet and I ran a randomization code and had it randomly pull one of those people to win. And that mug will be going out to... Are you on the edge of your seat? I know you are. This is pretty cool. Okay, fine. I'll just tell you. (laughs) Isis Kennedy Hart. So congratulations, Isis Kennedy Hart. Although I feel weird congratulating you for a mug about my own podcast, but I know you're excited to get it. And we'll be in touch with you very soon so we can send it your way. So I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you like the mug, and I hope you drink some delicious tea Charlie's way. Anyway, last week, besides delaying the contest, I also gave a teaser for this week's chapter. And that's kind of the new format that I intend to follow, is that every other week we will do a teaser, and then the following week we will do the chapter. That, I find, is the best way to keep this momentum going for the story. Plus, it will afford you folks some of those behind-the-scenes episodes in, since I will do that kind of content on those in-between weeks. And and thank you for that feedback, saying how much you have enjoyed those things. But it also is going to give me more time to work on quality episodes, because, again, these things take time. I play all the music, I write all the music week to week, and the story, of course, and and I try to keep the momentum of my writing task going. Now, a lot of the story is written and the end of it is written, but I'm still filling in a few of the spaces and figuring a couple of the puzzle pieces on how they all fit together. When we last left our characters of How to Kill a Piano, and I'm not talking about the teaser, I'm talking about the last chapter that you heard in full. George was visiting Sarah after having just made an attempt on the piano's life And he went to Sarah and showed her that book, Invisible Perceptions. And he got to learn about her past and Charlie's past and how some of those pieces have have fit together in the past. This week's chapter picks off or picks up exactly where that left off. And you're about to happen. find out what happens once George returns home. Now the teaser, hmm, how does that fit in? Well, I suppose you're about to find out. So without further ado, this is chapter 16 of How to Kill a Piano. I call it Razor Blades and Tuning Forks. Enjoy. Scrutius and Absinthe were stirring in the early morning hours. Well, this was usually the time they had to themselves. They were at war. And when a demon's at war, there is no personal time. Scrutius was pacing the cemetery paths while Absinthe conducted the traffic flow of the intervals. With his clipboard in hand, he diligently took inventory of the night's collection. There were the usual items, unmatched socks, nail clippers, pen caps, headphones, car keys. Many of these items would be sent back to their owners and replaced in new locations the owners had surely already looked. 
other items were doomed to be lost forever. This particular take yielded a few unusual items out of the ordinary. One in particular that came through was a small, white book. It almost looked new. The embossed cover seduced Absinthe, and he couldn't help but pocket it without including it on the clipboard inventory. He hid it away as Scrutius paced by. Anything useful? Uh, just the usual. Nail clippers, yada yada. It would seem we have to go about this contemptible game with a bit more direction, chattered Scrutius. Ready the maiden. What if he doesn't survive? inquired Absinthe. Absinthe, dear Abby, turn your brain off. There's no time for it to get involved, Scrutius clapped back. That's its very purpose. None of us survive. We'll all end up in the same place eventually. Easy come, easy go. Don't get attached to things now. You know the drill. We can't play this game forever after all. It seems that you have... Well, when Cordiva says it's time to move on, we move on. No exceptions. But there are loopholes. Are you going to get the maiden ready, or do I need to make you do it? I know you're intelligent enough not to mess with Cordiva's wishes. Yes, boss. Absinthe replied. Being intelligent doesn't mean you know everything. It might mean you're comfortable challenging everything you know. It might mean that you can learn to change your mind and not get upset once you've learned that you were wrong. Being intelligent means that you know how to adjust your views. You know how to accept reality and move with it, not against it. The right books can help us do this. Not being afraid to read everything you believe outright can also help. It takes a rare kind of demon to be able to adjust one's view. They don't often bury their noses in books. They're usually too busy taking orders. Every once in a while, a demon gets some extra leisure time. Time away from their plants. Time that they can spend stumbling into a good book. A book recently changed my mind. In this case, about death. Death isn't always executed, if you'll excuse the pun, in a direct line. Sure, sometimes it can happen in an instant. Other times it's orchestrated slowly. Sometimes poetically. Sometimes it can be painful or peaceful. Other times death creeps up on us like the youth. For the Athanasians... It was a slow creep. Not often was death a surprise. They always had plenty of time to see it coming. That is, unless they've chosen to erase that path from their memories. If you knew when it was your time, would you play different notes? Would you make different choices? Maybe you'd play a completely different tune. Scrutius and Absinthe were waiting at the cemetery while the intervals were off fetching me for bait. Absinthe was sitting in front of one of the tombstones with his nose in a book. As Scrutius ascended the stairs to join him outside in the morning air, he noticed the book and quickly marched over to confront him. Where did you get that? (laughs) A book. Scrutius sneered. It's quite the read. You should really give it a whirl, Uncle. Give it a whirl? Give it a whirl, he says. Those blasted things. If I wanted to waste away my brain on one of those paper-cutted nightmares, don't you think I would have done so an eternity ago? I, I enjoyed it. I can feel my brain getting bigger with every page. Absinthe chuckled to himself as if he made a joke. Scrutius snatched the book from his hands. Give me that! Scrutius snapped the book closed and examined the cover. What is this? Invisible presumptions! It doesn't even have a good title! Scrutius rolled his eyes after misreading the cover and tossed the book to the cemetery floor. 
never once opening it. Invisible persuasions, Absinthe corrected sheepishly, leaving the book where it landed. Whatever. Books are dangerous, Abby. Why would you let a little thing like intelligence get in the way of your success? Well, I, 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 Absinthe stammered. An interval peeked its head around a nearby gravestone. Absinthe tried to shoo him back into hiding, hoping Scrutius wouldn't see. I, 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 I thought this book might help us trap. <laughs> I've certainly never let it worry me. Scrutius chirped, cutting him off, completely ignoring the words coming out of Absinthe's mouth as he turned away, absorbed in his own thoughts. Realizing that he may have made a grave mistake, Absinthe stood up and kicked the book behind the headstone, as if it had no importance. The interval waited silently, and upon the book's arrival, it grabbed it and scurried away. What do you suggest next, boss? Absinthe was hoping to engage Scrutius in conversation so that he wouldn't catch the interval in action as it faded away behind the other headstones, disappearing. With all evidence of the book in hand. Ugh, you're so daft sometimes. The plan is already in motion, Abby. Well, you had your nose stuck in your little book. I was out ordering the intervals to go fetch the boy. We might not be able to touch our dear patient, Charlie, but there's no magic protecting the kid. Anything appearing to protect him was simple smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors? Yes. Charlie's little amateur theatrics. His little divertisements. They're all clever conjuring illusions, cleverly scaring us away from even attempting it this way. Those wall monsters in the kid's room are mere drawings. And the stuffed koala guards are nothing more than children's toys. Children's toys? Yes, children. Toys. Am I speaking in tongues, Mr. Absinthe? Or are you having a heat stroke? Your suit looks a bit faded around the collar. Of course. Uh, right. No, I, I was just lost in thought, I guess. Well, out with it. We don't have all morning. What's on your mind? The sun will be putting us both to work shortly. Well, Absinthe looked around, making sure no one else was listening. Have you ever been in love? Have I what? The very fact that I hold the position I have for as long as I have should clue your thick skull into knowing there's no time for such nonsense. And don't you even think about doing it yourself. I was... Just thinking about the nightmare you chose for the kid. It's a strange choice. We don't really talk about each other much. So I thought, maybe you put yourself into your work. So you wouldn't have to speak about it otherwise. Abby. Mr. Absinthe. Get your head out of the air and back into the dirt where it belongs. That's enough of these books. That's the last of them. Do you understand? Yes, boss. If you keep reading this ridiculous nonsense, soon you're going to start believing it. And then you're going to start believing we're all fictional characters in someone else's story. And where is that going to get us? Hmm? I guess you're right. Good. It's settled then. Scrutius placed his hands on his hips and peered down the road at the cemetery grounds. Where the hell are those intervals? They should have been back here by now. Well, it took me a long time to learn the truth. Scrutius was responsible for my nightmares. He designed them in meticulous detail in the workshop beneath the cemetery, just as he designed the iron box I would soon find myself enclosed inside. The night after I returned from Sarah's piano lesson, I dreamt of Charlie. I dreamt that I was taking his photographs from picture frames around our house, this was particularly strange, as we didn't keep photos around the house, let alone photos of ourselves. Suddenly, I found myself outside in a garden, surrounded by a bed of colorful flowers. I'm seated on a stone bench in the center of everything. Next to me, I found a stack of photos and Charlie's safety razor that he never used, except on occasion. 
when he was traveling. I wish I could travel. I removed the blade from the razor, carefully keeping my fingers away from the double edge. I used it to slice Charlie's photograph in half with a satisfying sound. I then lifted the blade up to eye level, letting the blade catch the sun. I stuck out my tongue and then carefully laid it across the tip. I drew my tongue inward into my mouth and closed it inside. I watched the entire scene from inside my head and I couldn't stop it. This continued for a second time. I found myself looking down at the stone bench and inside the razor, there was a new blade. Inside the picture frame was another photo. This time, it wasn't of Charlie. But it was of a woman that I had never met. And for some reason, I used the razor to slice her in half with a quick stroke of the blade. Then... Just as I rehearsed the first time, I opened my mouth, stuck out my tongue, and laid the blade across the tip. I drew the blade into my mouth and started to chew. There was no blood, and surprisingly, I felt no pain. As I looked down and watched my hands acting on their own, I noticed a new blade was inside the safety razor. I opened it up and I removed the blade carefully. A new photo (laughs) appeared in the frame. This time, it wasn't a person at all, but a cat. The feline had electric green eyes and whiskers that seemed to reach past the very bounds of the glossy paper that contained it. I quickly sliced it in half. I opened my mouth And as my free hand grabbed the wrist of the hand holding the blade in an attempt to hold it back, I found myself unable to resist laying that third blade across my tongue to draw it inward into my mouth. My lips closed around it, and I started to chew the pieces of metal, grinding them between my canines. Looking down, the safety razor was empty, and I started to choke. I tried to stand, but I found my ankles shackled to the bench, and I couldn't escape it. A small box of dental floss appeared to my left. And as I choked, I struggled, but I managed to open the box and pull a strand of floss extending it at arm's length. I used the box to slice it free and then slowly drew the strand into my mouth like a piece of spaghetti. For some reason, this made logical sense at the time. As dangerous as it was, none of this seemed out of the ordinary. Maybe I could fish out the blades from my esophagus with the floss. I nearly took the entire strand in, leaving a small tip jetting out from between my lips. My tongue went to work. My throat contracted, and I began to dry vomit. The blades felt like potato chips lodged in my throat. Except far worse. After what seemed like days, but only really was a few seconds, I slowly began to pull the floss from between my lips. The first blade was found tied, dangling from the floss. I pulled a little further, then a little further, only to find the next blade dangling, tied safely, in place. Pulling a little more, everything locked in place. I tugged, but the floss didn't move. The razor blade had 
lodged itself on an angle at the back of my mouth. I found myself having to tug with considerable force before I could dislodge the last blade. The once white floss emerged completely covered in red, and yet when I examined my mouth and tongue, I seemed unscathed. I meticulously stacked the blades and wrapped the floss around them, binding them together into a small stack. I dropped them into an envelope, stuck out my tongue, and licked the glue to seal it shut. As the rough surface of my tongue met the tacky surface of the glued paper, I felt a sting cut through me as the paper sliced into the muscle of my tongue in an odd bit of devilish irony. This was when I began to realize I was asleep and trapped in my own head. I watched myself address the envelope. It happened three times. First, I saw myself write something I couldn't read. Then, I watched myself address it to the seer. Then, finally, I saw myself addressing it to death. But death had a name, and she called herself Cordiva. When they arrived, I was still asleep. I awoke as I heard three chords radiate up through the floorboards into my bedroom. It was morning, but the sun was barely peeking its fiery head over the horizon. I was woken by the sound of the Hazelton. But it wasn't Charlie playing. My eyes shot open, and I found myself struggling against something through the darkness. The intervals had me by the arms, dragging me from my bed as the wall monsters watch motionless. I'm being carried on top of the tiny little arms of each interval, like I'm crowd surfing at a concert, but I'm not in control of my direction. I feel a cloth bag pulled down quickly over my face. It feels scratchy against my nose, and I'm finding it hard to breathe because I'm panicking. And my heart is beating rapidly in my chest, playing a timpani of different tones, as I imagine you'd do the same. I feel the hands below me pushing me, pulling me, and I feel the cool of the outside air hit the bare skin of my exposed arms as I find myself outside being carried down our driveway. I can't scream. I open my mouth, but no sound comes out, and then suddenly... I can't move my mouth anymore, for it's been immobilized. Not by a gag, but by some invisible force that has failed to immobilize the rest of me. The intervals struggle to get me inside the back of Scrutius and Absinthe's van as I'm kicking with all my strength. I hear the engine turn like a smoker coughing between cigarettes. They wrestle me in and slam the doors, locking me in tightly. I didn't know it at the time, but they were taking me to the cemetery. They were taking me to die. There was a loud thunk as my forehead hit the lid as they stood me up inside the iron box and stood the whole apparatus upright. I found that there were three small holes in the box two positioned at eye level so I could see a limited view of the room, and the third I could only feel at the back of my head as I couldn't lift my arms up to be sure that it was there. I heard two men walk into the room. I was sure it was those salesmen who delivered that piano to us. But all I could hear were their voices when they spoke. Should we tell him or let it be a surprise? (laughs) Chuckled Scrutius. Surprise, Absinthe grinned. I first heard what sounded like a piece of metal clank on the outside of the box. And as they touched the end of the singing bar to the casing of the metal, The sound amplified and filled the inside of the Iron Maiden, sending a pinching sting through my head. I tried to scream, but as before, no sound came from my mouth. Then, 
They performed the ritual again. They hit the bar against the box with a loud clack and then touched the end of that bar through the small hole at the back of my scalp. The sound pounded through my ears and for a moment the whole room went dark for me. And then I heard the footsteps of the two men quietly fade away. A spotlight hit my face, and I felt like I was being held captive on some sadistic version of The Price is Right, but I didn't want to come on down. The footsteps returned. And for the first time, I could see a figure appear in front of me. I wish I could reach over to pinch myself, but... I can't move my arms. But it looks like Uncle Charlie. And I can't call out to him because I can't move my mouth. But then he spoke. I'm so, so very sorry to get you involved in all this, George. That's when I knew. That's when I knew we were in some serious trouble. I heard the two men's voices cut through everything. Scrutius's voice was first. It's just a matter of time before you join us, too. (laughs) It's going to be you or it's going to be Charlie. And we already have Charlie, so you might as well give up and play with us. Absinthe stayed quiet. I thought of Sarah. I thought of Sharon. I thought at any moment Sharon's going to bust in and save me like they did all those other times. I kept expecting to wake up. I hoped that this was just another nightmare. But this was real life. There was no stopping it. And I felt helpless for the first time. But I guess that's part of growing up. And I was simply going to have to learn how to adapt. The trouble is, how do you adapt to your own demise? no matter how slow it might be. That concludes another episode of How to Kill a Piano. Thanks for tuning in. And please don't forget to like this episode and share this episode with your friends. Please tell your friends about it, not just in conversation, but if you can actually make a post on your Facebook or your Instagram or your Twitter or whatever your favorite social media platform is to help spread the word. Or perhaps you know somebody who's a big deal and can help get this in front of someone really important in the world of of fiction or audiobooks or movies or television or or okay I'm dreaming a little big there but still if you know some cool people that would like this and enjoy this please send it their way every listener counts and you're all very important to me and I thank you very much. As always, the story was written by yours truly. The music was composed and recorded live to tape by yours truly on my Yamaha electric piano. And next week, I plan to tell you about a recent adventure I had with a baby grand piano in real life. But I'll save that story for next week. Until then, enjoy yourselves as always. And if you can't enjoy yourself, enjoy someone else with their consent. Thanks as always. I'll see you next week. Don't forget to visit us at howtokillapiano.com.